Hello, I'm Pastor Mike Ritten. I'm with the Bowman Charge of the United Methodist Church located in Bowman, South Carolina. The weather here has gotten a little bit chilly. Uh, temperatures in the evening are down into the 30s and we've even had a few 20s located. Uh, during the day it's been up in the 50s and low 60s and supposed to be down into the 40s a couple of days. So I'm wearing my nice new flannel shirt that my wife gave me and appropriately colored red and black for red for the season. So anyway, I hope you've had a good week and uh, this is my sermon for the second Sunday in Advent, which will be December 6th. So let us open with a word of prayer. O oh God, our Father, who didst send forth thy Son to be King of kings and Prince of peace, grant that all the kingdoms of the world may become the kingdom of Christ and learn of him the way of peace. Send forth among all peoples a spirit of good will and reconciliation. We ask these things and pray this prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. The scripture lesson is from the lectionary, the gospel lesson for the, from the lectionary, and it comes from the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter, verses 1 through 8. Again, that's the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Hear now the inspired inerrant word of God. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I am sending my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all of the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God, or the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Again, that was from the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter, verses 1 through 8. And I've entitled my sermon, A Lifelong Project. Did you ever stop to wonder what life was like for Jesus as a child? The Bible has almost nothing to say about the time between the visit of the wise men in Jesus' hometown until he was about 12 years old. That 10-year period is blank, except for a brief statement that states Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and was in favor with God and men. We do know that Jesus' earthly father was a carpenter, so we assume that Joseph would have trained Jesus to be a carpenter. We also know that John, the John who would later be known as John the Baptist, was six months older than Jesus and was probably a cousin. We know that his mother Mary and Elizabeth, John's mother, were very close. I like to think that John and Jesus were growing up, they, they often played together. I like to think that John and Jesus grew up as best friends. They certainly were best friends once they were grown. The words best friends, though, really aren't adequate to describe J 
John's relationship to Jesus. In our lesson for today, John describes Jesus as one who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. And then John concludes this part with, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I'm getting my head ahead of myself here a bit. So let's look at our, our text again. The very first verse in Mark's gospel states, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. If you were trying to tell the story of Jesus' life, which is what Mark is trying to do, how would you start? Our favorite story of Jesus' childhood comes from Luke's Gospel. Luke was the one who tells us about the angel appearing to Mary, the baby Jesus, the stable, the manger, and of course, the shepherds. Luke's Gospel is clearly the favorite when it comes to the story of Jesus as a baby. It was made famous by the cartoonist Charles Schultz when he composed and and they did the Charlie Brown's Christmas story. There's a scene where Linus comes out on stage, the house lights dim and the spotlight illuminates him, and Luke just, just he does the, the whole story about Jesus' birth that's listed in Luke's Gospel. It's beautiful, and I know many of us grew up watching that. However, I'd like to draw your attention to something that you may have overlooked in Luke's Gospel. Luke tells us that before the angel appeared to Mary to tell her about Jesus' upcoming birth, that angel appeared to Zechariah, John's father, to tell Zechariah that John would be born. In Luke, the stories of John and Jesus are intertwined. John first, because he was born first. The angel appeared first to Zechariah, who happened to be a priest and worked in, in the temple, and then appeared to Mary. First John was born to Elizabeth, then Jesus was born to Mary. That's the way that Luke tells a story, our favorite story among the four Gospels. Let's do a quick comparison of all four Gospels. Matthew starts with a genealogy, tracing Jesus' ancestry from Abraham through David to Joseph, the husband of Mary. That's definitely not our favorite Christmas story, but Matthew also tells us about the visit of the wise men, and that is part of our favorite story. The Gospel of John starts very differently. John was a theologian and a poet, so he starts by saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Mark states his story of Jesus by stating the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark packs a whole lot in that very short sentence. He tells us that Jesus is good news. That's what the word gospel means. He tells us that Jesus is the Christ, meaning the Messiah. Then he says that Jesus is the Son of God, just in case we missed the point. Next, Mark tells us that God sent John, John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, as a messenger to prepare the way for Jesus. John was the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord, making his path straight. Mark says that John set up his pulpit in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. As far as most Jews were concerned, that was all wrong. For them, baptism was for Gentiles. 
circumcision. Circumcision was the way that Jewish males were baptized. John was calling Jews to repent of their sins and to be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. Why would Jews need to be baptized? They were already the people of God. However, John was saying, yes, you are the people of God, but, but you're also sinners. You need to repent. You need to be baptized. You need to have your sins forgiven. That was the sermon that John was preaching in the wilderness, in the desert, in the middle of nowhere. If you were a preacher with an important message, where would you set up your pulpit? Billy Graham set up his big tent in Los Angeles. The Pope came to Shea Stadium. After all, that's where the people are, in the cities. Billy Graham could have set up his tent in the wilderness. All he had to do was move, oh, a couple hundred miles east of Los Angeles. There is plenty of desert out there. 29 palms for those in the Marine Corps and Navy. The Pope could have moved across the river to New Jersey. People of New York City think that New Jersey is a desert. Neither Billy Graham nor the Pope went to the wilderness because they wanted to be where the people were. The wilderness had a special meaning for the Jewish people. Their ancestor, ancestors had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. That's where they became a nation, in the wilderness. That's where God sealed his covenant with the Jewish people. So, John the Baptist set up his pulpit in the wilderness, and the people came in groves to hear him. They came from the little towns and villages throughout Israel. That wasn't surprising because there wasn't much going on in those places. Those people needed some entertainment. People also came in groves from the big city of Jerusalem. They didn't have to do that. They had it all. Priests, Levites, Pharisees, rabbis, you name it. For the Jewish people, Jerusalem was the center of the universe. Why would the people of Jerusalem go out into the middle of nowhere to hear John preach. Let me tell you why they went. They went into the wilderness to hear John preach because he was a prophet, a great prophet. It had been 400 years since Israel had heard a great prophet, and the people were hungry, hungry to hear one. Prophets tell the truth. Prophets lead people in the right direction. So the people went by the thousands into the desert to hear what John had to say. Oh, how I wish we had a great prophet in America today. We have all kinds of politicians telling us what we want to hear. Instead of reading tea leaves or listening to the people, they tend to read the polls, and then they tailor their message to fit the polls. Never mind the fact that 90% of the politicians never keep their campaign promises once they're elected. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have a great prophet who'd lead us in the right direction, who'd tell us the truth, who'd call us to repent of our sins, and it would show us the way out of the mess that we're in. We could use a prophet today. Would people travel to the wilderness to hear such a prophet? I think they would. Would they elect him or her president? 
Uh, I don't know. We want our medicine sugar-coated. We want our roads paved and our treasuries filled. If someone has to make sacrifices, the attitude is, let it be the other guy. Not many Americans are interested in repentance today. Until we are, I don't see much hope that things will get better. However, John was a great prophet, a real one, and he called people to real repentance. He called them to acknowledge their sins. He called them to turn around and face in another direction. He called them to let God set the direction for their lives, even if that turned out to be costly for them. People who heard John preach knew that they'd heard something special. They knew that John was a real deal. They knew that they could trust him. So they went back to their villages or to Jerusalem, and they told their friends and neighbors. Before long, it was SRO in the desert, standing room only. Everyone wanted to hear what John had to say. Everyone wanted to hear a real prophet for a change. Here's what they heard. Repent, be baptized, get your sins forgiven, let God change your life. People loved it because they knew John was right. They came and they listened. They repented and were baptized. When they went home, they were different people. John had changed their lives. Let me rephrase that. God had changed their lives. Yet John did something else as well. He proclaimed, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The one who was to come, of course, was Jesus. Like John, Jesus came calling people to repent. He calls us to repent. He calls us to be baptized. Jesus has baptized us, not only with water, but with the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit. When we believe in Jesus, he changes our lives. Let those of us who have repented continue to repent, because repentance is a lifelong project. The world is like a big magnet, always tempting us, pulling us away from the Jesus path. The devil specializes in getting our attention, in tempting us, in tripping us up. Like a spaceship going to Mars, we need a million mid-course corrections to get where we're going. We call those mid-course corrections repentance. Repentance is changing our direction so that we can walk with Jesus. Repentance is our daily task. We never get over the need to repent. We never get over the need to let Jesus show us the right direction, to keep us back on the path that leads to heaven. Forgiveness is another lifelong project. Every day is a new opportunity to forgive someone. Every day is another opportunity to forgive and to be forgiven. To those who haven't repented, who haven't been baptized, who haven't received forgiveness for their sins, Jesus says, do those things now. Repent. 
be baptized, be forgiven. This is the first day of your rest of your life. Answer Jesus' call. Repent, be baptized, and be forgiven. By doing those things, you have Jesus by your side all the rest of your life. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for sending us your son Jesus to teach these lessons. And we thank you for the men who the Holy Spirit inspired to put the words on the paper and save them, and who collected all of them into what we now call our modern day Bible. As we approach this Advent season or continue in it, Christmas is right around the corner and we will celebrate the birth of your son, Jesus. What a glorious event it was. At the same time, Advent reminds us that there's another coming, a second coming of your son Jesus. It'll be that coming in which he will come, take all those who believe in him, and take us to heaven where there will be a whole new world. So, Lord, we thank you again for the many blessings that you've bestowed upon each and every one of us. We ask that you continue to watch over us, guide us, and help us to live our lives according to your will. During this festive season of love, joy, and peace, help us to continue that love, joy, and peace through the coming new year. Again, Lord, if there is anybody who has not yet accepted you as the Lord and Savior of their lives, I pray that during this time of Advent, they will make that choice. They will ask Jesus to come into their lives, into their heart, sweep away all the, the junk and the, the evil thoughts, the sinful ways, turn us around and help us to live new lives. As Paul says, when we have Christ in us, we become a new cre creature. The old person has died, and the new person with Christ living in them starts a whole new life. And so, Lord, we thank you for sending us the Holy Spirit. May the Holy Spirit continue to watch over us, guide us, remind us of Jesus' teachings and teachings of Scripture and be there to help guide us each and every day of our lives. I ask these things and pray this prayer in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed uh, this week's sermon. We're getting closer and closer to Christmas and uh, I've got a message coming for Christmas. I haven't quite decided if I'm gonna do a regular sermon for the Sunday before Christmas, or if we're going to do something a little bit different. But anyway, y'all take care, stay warm, stay safe, keep the social distancing. Remember to send in your tithe and your offerings to your church treasurer, and don't forget about the Sunday offering. Let us close with a benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. That takes care of it for this week. I hope you enjoyed. Take care. God bless. And hopefully I'll see you all next week.